morning, everybody. Um, I would also like to thank the organizers for letting me uh, give my presentation here. Um, I work in Rob Lavinia's lab, but also in the Institute for Agricultural and Fisheries Research, and that's why I'm combining page with food products. And um, so I come to the title of my presentation, which are, uh, is the control of the soft trout bacterium Dickia solani um, with specific bacteriophages. I will first start with a short introduction, and I, of course I have to start with the potato. It's not only in Belgium a very important vegetable, but also in the rest of the world. With, uh, it's the fourth agricultural crop in the world, uh, and um, the most important thing, of course, are the fries, which are not actually French fries, but more Belgian fries. Um, but this is only 50% of potato production is used for food. Uh, other uses are starch production, livestock feed, or seed potato production. Now, what we have is a bacterium uh, which causes soft rot uh, on the potatoes and which, of course, um, causes the production to be lower. Um, this bacterial genus, Dickia species, is um, previously been called Erwinia, and some of you might know it under that name, or Pectobacterium chrysanthemy. And um, you've already heard the talk of Peter Finneran, who has been working on a pectobac another Pectobacterium species. Now, there are seven species of Dickia, uh, the first of which, Dickia solani, has not ac actually been accepted as a species yet, and it has recently uh, emerged, and it's more virulent than the other uh, species who have been seen before. And only two of them are found in Belgium, um, but the other uh, Dickia species have been found on potato uh, in the rest of the world, except for the last one, Dickia paradisiaca. So the disease symptoms are uh, black leg, which is actually rotting of the stem, or a soft rot, um, which is caused by tissue maceration. And it's not really clear on the, the picture because it's colorless. Now, this bacterium is, uh, has spread all over the world uh, with some regional differences. So in Europe, um, it is mostly Dickia solani and Dianticola. Uh, in some countries, uh, only the one uh, or only the other one. And in Belgium, the Netherlands, England, it is both of them. Um, for example, in Australia and New Guinea, uh, it is only Dickia Z, which is found on potato. Um, and uh, the yellow ones are the ones that has, have not been typed at the species level yet. So you can see it's spread all over the world and it's potentially a problem all over the world. Now I come to a form of solution for this problem, which is phage limestone. Um, I gave it this name because it's easily pronounceable, but the lime actually stands for um, the place of isolation and study. Uh, Leuven. Ilvo, which is the institute I work for, and Medeldeke, the place of isolation. Now we found uh, two limestone isolates, isolates, which I've called limestone one and limestone two, to keep it easy, which only uh, differ in uh, two bands in their restriction pattern of their DNA. Um, and that's why we postulate that it's one species called limestone. Now this is the morphology. Uh, as you can see, it's a myovirus um, with an isometric head. And recently, we've suggested that uh, there are a l some other phages which look exactly the same in the EM, and that they all belong to uh, the same genus called Viuna-like virus, uh, which has recently been accepted and published. Um, so you see that uh, there's a line drawing and this is the schematic of how all of them look like. Um, with, uh, you can see that there, are no, that, are, that there are no tail fibers, but like branch-like, umbrella-like structures of tail spikes, which is really uh, the first time we've seen it. So I've did some uh, characterization of this phage to see what, whether, it's, it's, um, whether I can use it in phage therapy. Um, the first thing I saw is that it's, 
it infects 100% of the Dicchio Solani streams we've collected at our uh, agricult agricultural institution. Um, and it didn't infect any of the environmental samples we've collected from potato. So I also did a test on the global, on our global Dicchia set um, we have collected in our institution, and we saw that none of the other species, whether they were collected from potato or another uh, plant, were infected by either limestone one or limestone two, but that a lot of them showed lysis from without. So there's something there, but we haven't um, investigated this further. Um, the genome. Um, we've uh, found that it is 152,000 base pairs, 201 ORFs, one tRNA, and what we saw is that um, functional units are dispersed throughout the genome. Um, I found 41 um, structural genes um, confirmed by mass spectrometry, and there is one region where they are here, where they are, they show um, a big, uh, they show um, homology to T4 and are in the same order. Um, there are also, uh, which is not as common, uh, a lot of uh, homing endonucleases which are indicated in green. Um, despite this dispersion of the functional units, uh, we saw that there are a lot of the, the Viona-like phages I told you about earlier show the same um, um, DNA homology. So this is a blast N of seven phages. Limestone has, is at the bottom. Um, and they all have the same genome, whether they are from a uh, Dickia phage, uh, so limestone, from E. coli, uh, FAX1 and CBA120, or from Salmonella, uh, SFP10, Phi SH19 or VI1, or even from Shigella, uh, Phi S. Boehm AG3. So this is quite interesting, and if you want, um, I'm not going to go into detail on this, but if you want to know about it, there are a lot of people here who can tell you more about it. Uh, for, for example, Betty Cutter, or Andrew Kropinski, or Hans Ackermann. So um, this is a really interesting group, but not that important for what's coming. So then I come to the interesting part, the phage therapy part. Uh, I've done some in vivo assays, the first one, I actually wanted to quantify uh, the reduction, I hoped, the reduction of rot when I added my phage. So what I did, I w was uh, weighing individual tubers, cutting out a piece of it, and then inoculating with either water or bacteria, and then with either phage or buffer, um, so I had a control set as well. Then I incubated them in separate uh, cups, on the most moist paper tissue for three days at uh, 28 degrees. And then I saw rot. Um, and luckily for me, this was odorless, which cannot be said from other uh, potato rots. Um, so I cut out the piece of the rot and I weighed the tubers again. And this is what I saw. So this is for us uh, an experiment done with tubers of the cultivar Binche, which is a very important cultivar in Belgium. So first of all, um, we saw a significant reduction in the number of tubers which um, rotted. So in the, so this is only with Dickia Solani. Um, here were, we had 18 out of 20 or 19 out of 20 tubers that rotted. Um, and for limestone two and limestone one, this reduction dropped to about 10 out of 20. So I will be focusing now on only the rotten tubers. So you can see that the amount of rot dropped from about, about 40%, 45% to about 12, 15%, which is a very significant reduction. And the control just shows a variation of my system with the weighing before and after incubation. So we see that an, at an MOI of 100, both limestone one and limestone two significantly reduce tuber rot. So I did these res uh, uh, results again on another cultivar, uh, Condor. Um, and then I tested if 
MOI 1 or 100, uh, if it would make a difference. And we, what we saw is that MOI 10 really wasn't as good. Um, so at least MOI 100 to be used in further experiments. So then I uh, started a field trial last year. So I had uh, four uh, different treatments on untreated control. Uh, and the rest of the tubers I inoculated uh, by vacuum, vacuum infiltration with uh, my pathogen, uh, which meant that I um, put the tubers in a suspension of the bacterium, put them in the vacuum incubator, and then uh, turned it to vacuum, and then let the air back in, which meant that uh, the bacteria really were really pushed uh, underneath the skin of the potato tuber. Um, and then I sprayed, afterwards I sprayed my phage, only limestone one on it. Um, and then I tried what would be the difference if I planted them wet or dry uh, for the limestone treated one. So in total I had four treatments uh, in a Latin square design, uh, which looked like the left one is when I planted them and the right one is during the season. I, I followed the symptoms and during the season, uh, season, I already saw that um, symptoms were not as severe on the limestone treated plants as on the untreated plants. Um, but what that would mean for yields, um, I could not really say because all plants showed some form of um, wilting or stem rot. So the first significant thing I noticed it is don't plant your tubers wet. Because what we, we, we created was a localized anaerobiosis, which meant that the bacterium could really go for it and outcompete the, the bacteriophages. Second thing was that we saw a 13% yield increase after phage treatment. Now, scientifically, you may think, ha, huh, 13% doesn't seem like a lot. But for a farmer, if you say do this and you'll have a 13% yield increase, that really is something. So um, while the, it's, it's, I couldn't tell whether it's significant because it's a total yield, I would say um, this requires further investigation. So I went, um, I collected all the potatoes, I washed them, I weighed them separately, I measured them separately so I could really investigate where the 13% came from. Now, if you look at the total number of tubers for the um, uninfected, uh, the control, and the phage treated, it's almost the same. Um, but there was a significant, there was a, 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 um, a drop in yield. Um, so that comes from somewhere. Um, and this, the untreated ones, um, there's a much, uh, Low, uh, lower number of total tubers. Now I divided them in size classes. Why did I do that? Because it's important for um, growers, for farmers, um, when they sell their potatoes, you get a different price for different sizes of tubers. So the most important um, size category is the plus 55 millimeters, because these are the potatoes that can be used for making the fries. <laughs> so the other classes were not significant, si significantly different from each other, but these were. So this, uh, the uninfected and the infected were significantly different, and the phage treated were somewhere in between, which meant that we, we are on the right course. And at this moment, I have another field trial in progress where we are looking for... Um, um, we, we haven't infected all tubers, and we're looking for... Um, a, a better way um, to to interpret the results and looking for um, if this way the in this way uh, our treatment will yield more results. So, um, oh, I also yeah. When you look at the number of tubers per plant in this large size class, you can see the difference on the box plot. But this is um, because there's so little or uh, tubers per plant, it's not really significant, but you can see the trend. And then in conclusion, I can say that um, for m during my research, I was able to, in, uh, to isolate Dicchio specific phages, 
Uh, I did an extensive characterization of limestone one and limestone two, which I have not showed, uh, showed today. Um, but it, in conclusion, they were deemed fit for use in phage therapy. Then in an um, in vivo lab test on tubers, we could significantly reduce tuber rot with phage application. And in our field trial, we see that if you treat uh, plants uh, tubers with uh, phages before planting, that you can uh, increase your yield and that you should not plant your tubers wet. So I would like to thank some people, my uh, PhD supervisors, Rob, Tina, and Maurice, um, Andrew Kopinski for the sequencing, uh, Hans Ackermann and Derek Picard for the EMs, and all the Viuna-like virus people who have contributed to this new genus, and my colleagues at the Laboratory of Gene Technology, not Gene Technology, and the Institute for Agricultural and Fisheries Research, in specific, Peter Jan, who has to me, uh, taught me everything about phages that I know now, Dieter, who was my student and helped with a lot of stuff, uh, and um, Johan and Johan for their help with the potato trials. Thank you. Uh, we have time for a few questions. One over there. Yes, no, I only used the one because we saw that um, they gave the same results. And I've also done some resistance uh, tests, which I haven't shown, and I've noticed that they use the same receptor. So it wouldn't be good to, uh, it wouldn't uh, make a difference to use both of them. Uh, no, I, I always did the, the experiments uh, separately because I knew um, it would not yield too much. One question over there in the middle. Uh, do you have any indication of the phage survival in the soil over the course of treatment? Are you following that at all or looking at how to extend that with uh, the application? No, we're not um, compromising the, the test by um, yeah, uh, harvesting the, the tubers in advance. But what we did see is that in um, two years, um, we isolated these phages from the soil um, close to where we've um, done the, the tests. So this, um, these, phages, these phages have been isolated a lot um, in separate um, isolation rounds. So we assume that they are very stable in that soil environment. Yeah, actually, following the questions, did you try to find a phage after the tree or at the end, looking at the phage on the ground? <coughs> if there are more phages on the line where you have the treatment versus the other line? Uh, no, I haven't done it, but I, it's a good idea to do it for my current field trial. Um, but I can never exclude the fact that they are already present in the soil, and I do, ha do not have a uh, specific um, qPCR assay to to find them at this point. So, no more question. Thank you.